Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you, uh, Russ, for that introduction. Um, my name is Lex Parker, and I model the D and RGW Railroad. My presentation for part one is basically focusing on Chama, New Mexico, which is the, uh, the, the principal um, part of my layout. And uh, but I'll start off first with my, my previous layout because it was, um, it was a transition between uh, a point to point and one that was a loop and for, some, for several reasons. But I discovered that um, my first layout um, not, unintentionally became a learning lesson. I learned a lot of things that, uh, on how to do uh, different kinds of models. Um, I should get myself a pointer here, excuse me a second. Okay, so um, the transition came in the latter part of the 90s. Uh, but when I started, we built our house in 1980 and planned my new layout in half my basement, measuring approximately 15 by 40. The idea was to get as much linear footage, footage beyond the wall perimeter in that space without a duck under. And so two peninsulas were pulled out at each end. This created a point-to-point -point layout, and one had a turntable and at that, that end, and the other had a Y, so trains could be reversed. You can see um, uh, my yard, which was Charma, it was only about eight feet here, so it was a very small area for Charma. It did leave and go across the Charma River, around through what is the Phantom Curve, and through Mud Tunnel across a trestle that was on a tallow slope, uh, a scratch-built um, cascade trestle, and into the Y. And this, and this was uh, Pagosa Springs here, or Pagosa Junction. The back track is on the Y, takes you into Black Canyon. So this was a very easy way of turning a train around at each end. So the transition, same, same basement, my, uh, um, my family, my youngsters had all moved out on, uh, on their own. So I was able to reclaim this part of the layout, uh, put a shop in this area over here. And uh, the green line will indicate, indicates the main line going around the layout. So the first layout was substantially complete and I took it down in 95 to make way for the new track plan now that I had that added space. And that would extend into that family room. I started construction in 1996, completing the table and all the operating track that same year. Chama Yard was the focus and keeping it fairly accurate with the yard, the track plan and the layout of most of the structures. The main line passes through Chama with a single meandering main line shown in green, uh, taking you to several location stops along the way and then returning to Chama. So what I done is I, I um, up the track plan and um, determined the switches and the numbers and the grades and so on. And um, then what I did was develop a tabletop for that track plan. Now, one of the lessons I learned in my first layout was if you want to if you want to if you wanted to uh, take a layout down and you're going to trash it it's not a big issue but if you want to take it down and have it in uh, existing in another layout or somewhere else that's a little bit more tricky and of course that was a tough lesson you going through trying to cut the layout apart so in red uh, is basically a frame. So the, <clears throat> I, I created these frames that were no longer than eight feet and <clears throat> two feet deep. And they sit on an L girder that runs around the layout. Where they come together is, would be secured with, with a couple of screws and secured onto the L girder. And by so doing, um, if I, do, if I want to take the layout apart, I just have to unscrew everything, lift, unscrew it from the L girders and cut, just cut through the track and the scenery on those joint connections 
And then I can lift that whole section out intact and have it much e more easily connected to the one beside it at another stage. The yellow part that you see here, that's all, that's all 5 8 um, uh, exterior sheathing, and I use exterior sheathing because it is has it has some water resistance, especially with all the water we tend to throw on the layout of scenery. So these are all four by eight panels, and then a little narrow uh, twenty four inch panel here, and they sit on the frames. And then what I did <coughs> is <coughs> of the wiring had I you know bored holes through all the joists all the way through, and um, the um, the duck under to get into the inside is under this area right here. I had to have a duck under, so we'll work on that next. Now, one of the things that um, I try to do on my, on my layout is to keep it very simple and with attention to the uh, to the layout itself, not the uh, not the rest of the room. And so I hung all the exterior uh, uh, parts of the layout table on the wall with gussets. So there are no legs over here and you'll see why in a few minutes. And on the the island, the, the peninsula, uh, these are two by two legs at six foot centers and they just go down the side and, uh, and work into the layout of these more complicated panels. Um, so here, um, are some images of the present layout. Um, you'll see on the top left, um, my philosophy for my layout is that I want the layout to be a showpiece. So I don't want any clutter or storage underneath the layout. And the face and the walls and the flooring had to be all a dark neutral color so that any color and everything else is set off above the tabletop. Um, in the top middle, you'll see these are gussets. These are 24 by 24 gussets that are secured to the studs in the wall. And they go all the way around the room except where the peninsula is. On the bottom left, uh, you can see the two by two leg, uh, the one by three and one by three L girder. And, the, uh, and these, this is a joist here, and, but right above it is a tray. So you get two of the uh, one by threes uh, on, on each frame. Uh, butting against each other and are secured. And then the trays are secured from the, to the L girder from the underside, the leg just sits in here. Um, on various locations where the control panels are, uh, there's a uh, storage rack for a card system, um, helped design by uh, my friend Dave Burrows. Um, top right is a little more complicated. These are the control panels and I designed the layout in CAD and gave uh, a, a friend of ours who was a printer um, the image and he put it on a negative that they use in, in the printing process for newspapers. And it comes out with a uh, sheet of aluminum and it has an emulsion of some sort on it, some chemical. And when it's passed under the un ultralight ultraviolet light with the, with the, uh, uh, the, um, the negative that's on, uh, on the surface of it, it changes the color of the unexposed areas, or I should say the exposed areas, which gives you those lines. Then what I did is I took that to a client of mine uh, who has a body shop, and um, I was able to use his spray booth and, and coat the entire uh, face of the all, four, there are four panels, uh, in automotive clear coat. So, there, it, you know, it, it, there's nothing to rub off or damage on the, on the face. And um, there's a little more detail on, on the uh, third part on that. The duck under on the bottom right, um, I've been under many layouts, including this one before I, I finished this and had a few scrapes on my back. Uh, so I decided to put a, put a padded duck under on the underside of the uh, layout. Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> it is removable, uh, so I get access to wiring and so on going through. And you can see here, for example, what uh, the layout looks like, you know, without any of my storage and uh, items that on the on the floor. It just keeps it more attractive up at the top. 
Uh, now, just a very quick review of my first layout because um, a lot of elements that, that uh, I did there I, I, was a learning curve for me in, in, uh, in model building and, and doing scenery at this scale. Uh, this is the first layout, point to point charm at Pagosa Springs, ON3. The top left is just an overview of the yards with the ash pit, water tank, and the sand house. All of that was basically in an eight foot section. The bottom left is a uh, roundhouse. This was Thomas York's, uh, um, one, the first one I ever had of his, um, of the roundhouse with plaster walls, which are absolutely excellent. The rest is all scratch built. Uh, the bottom left, um, I like rocks and rock cuts. So this was a rock cut that I did just coming out of Charm. Well, no, it's not really in Charm that way. Uh, this is artist license. Um, I wanted something that was very uh, um, dramatic uh, as people came into the layout room and the first thing they would see was, was this scene here. And the bottom right was uh, again another uh, lesson that I learned about uh, weathering wood. Uh, these are timbers that are supporting the bends of the cascade trestle and they're severe, some fairly well, well weathered because it, you know there's a river running underneath a lot of humidity uh, and so on. This was, uh, so this is a look, um, uh, when the bottom right is actually when you, when is going into the Y. Um, let me start that over again. Let's go out of Charmer. Um, when you leave Charmer, uh, you, if you remember, I said you go around um, Phantom Curve and this is Phantom Curve here, it goes around. And Phantom Curve has these hoodoos. And I thought, well, that'll be a challenge. So. I decided to build these hoodoos, a little more than actually there. I wanted something that very strong and dramatic. And uh, I'll explain how I did this in uh, part three. The one thing you should notice at the top that I'll, I'll mention now is the back wall above the scenery is a mirror. And that enabled that mural and the ceiling and the light and lighting to go straight through uh, into the back of the mirror. And then the trees, <coughs> um, all these pine trees, uh, some are, especially these ones here, the low ones are mirrored, but I didn't want anybody to see that as, an, as a mirrored effect. And so I decided to take these pines here and I just shaved them in half, glue them to the face of the mirror and of course no, no reflection. And cascade trestle comes across and went into the Y to the right and to the back over here was, was uh, Black Canyon. A close up of the uh, the trestle, um, it's all scratch built. It's about uh, it was about 48 50 inches long. Uh, this was the Y, um, and I have a scratch built pile driver here that uh, is working replacing some pilings. Uh, there's a high low side gone carrying old and new pilings for replacements, and this. And then it goes with the uh, pile driver OB for extra parts and so on. All this mechanism is, work, is working. Uh, the braces come off, uh, the hinges all work, the, the entire rig falls down and it does run around the layout. Uh, Black Canyon is uh, what Black Canyon looks like on top left. And I just wanted something very uh, dramatic and rugged. Uh, uh, with very little color, it's mostly all with uh, grays and, and the black highlighting. And there's a couple of little steam locomotives coming out uh, through, through Black Canyon. Um, what's interesting here is the, uh, the smoke um, is not Photoshop. There was no Photoshop when I was doing this. Um, there was, it's also, um, uh, well, it, it's um, cotton wool uh, with a fine uh, brass wire up through the middle and airbrushed needed to be, you know, for the different tones and so on. And then there's a, there was a string on the end of it uh, that a second party would gently shake. And this is actually a time exposure in order to get, to get that effect. 
Uh, also do uh, uh, several waterfalls and rivers on that layer, which I, the method I still use today, and I learn a lot from these, uh, cascading water with froth and so on. There's a, a curve around here, le leaving a sandbank on the side. Um, and most, all of my rivers have always had fish. Um, and I'll explain how I did that at, at a later stage. Uh, now this is the finished layout as, as uh, I mentioned earlier, and you can see the main line of bow line going through in all the locations. The scale, the scale is one to 48, the one three, it's hand laid track and switches. Switch master stall motors for turnouts. I used weather, weathered railcraft code 83 on Matt Albert ties. Uh, the ballast is, is actual cinders courtesy of Strasbourg Railroad. Um, I, I use cork on the spline or plywood uh, roadbed. Uh, minimum radius is 42 inches and I use a 4% grade which was standard maximum uh, for the railroad. These are the two scenes looking each way on, on, uh, on, my, on my layout. Um, there's a duck under over here on the right hand side and this is looking east. Uh, this is all the yards here where the depot sits and the shops and the roundhouse and the coaling tower right at the back. Then it sweeps around and comes across the trestle here into Osier and past the Osier pens, follows the river and the Animus River into this, this rock face. Looking the other way, as, a, as we come along the river here, above it is the uh, track that goes up to the mine here. There's a gold mine up there, and there's a snowshed under construction. And then it wraps around, go, the track goes uh, around the back over a trestle through this mountain, loops around and comes back into the depot. Now, one of the other things uh, i like to point out that I've been using for many, many years are handrails. Uh, I think you've all seen and experienced people come and they got their hands up on the top edge. They're leaning their elbows across the top edge of the layout, wearing off all the scenery that you, you know, spent hours, uh, you know, creating. Um, so what I've done is every one of the viewpoints, I uh, did put continuous uh, handrails. And uh, you would not believe uh, the comfort that is created for visitors um, and um, they stay longer, it, it always seems. Um, the next thing I want to show is uh, the backdrops. Uh, back, uh, backdrops, uh, when I did this layout, we didn't, you know, there were no photographic uh, materials available. And uh, so um, uh, I have to I decide to paint this. Uh, I do have a tutorial on my website on how I did these uh, murals. Um, this one is an inspiration of the track that goes up to Silverton through these mountains that I want to use as a background. Um, in, in this case, I've got um, the fog of a, of a distant storm um, slowly receding. And I do have two speakers above this uh, with a recording of thunder and rain and so on that uh, plays the odd time. Backdrops, clouds, um, all of the trees, everything's done using a basting brush, uh, $2, a fan, fan brush, probably $8, uh, sponges, um, and I use uh, sea sponges for coarse, uh, um, le coarse leaf application and fine makeup sponges out of my wife's makeup drawer for the finest stuff. So what I've done is I just put the sponges into the paint and I dab it on and I slowly sort of do the blending. And the same thing with, with the trees, it's exactly the same. The aspens are very fine and the cottonwoods are much coarser. The uh, mountain here with snow on it, that actually is my first attempt at palette knife. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's interesting, you almost can't make a mistake. What I want to also point out here when you're doing these, these uh, doing murals is keep in mind the source of the light, left or right, and keep it consistent all the way. Now, the reason I went to painting backdrops is I didn't want a photographic mural to interfere with what I was modeling. So I, it, to me, it, it's, a, it's, it's like cartooning. I've taken the scene and I've cartooned it so that it's not fighting with the finer detail 
in the foreground. So that theory is that was my theory anyway that uh, evolved when when I had no choice but to paint. So this is the effect you get. I've got a peninsula down the center, and there's no backdrop to the peninsula. And so what I did um, was I changed the grades on the area, like in the back on the upper that's on the upper photograph. That's Osier against the other wall. And while the elevation in real life is much higher than Charmer, I lowered it so that when you take a photograph across, you've got this mural on the background, which is actually 12 feet away from where I'm standing. On the bottom picture, that's standing on the opposite side of the peninsula looking back and, and it's just, a, there's a nice sky uh, that's uh, behind Charmer. Uh, and I just paint the mural just below the table level. So when you're at this level, you don't see the base of the wall. Um, now we're looking at uh, Charmer West. Now I'm gonna start in the Charmer West and work my way down to the, to the east end of the yard in this, in this um, series. Um, the left side is um, the main line and the, and the switching into the yard tracks that are coming across in front of the, uh, um, the depot, which you can see on the right hand side. Um, all the track is hand laid. As I mentioned, the switches are all custom built to fit. I don't, I don't use, uh, or I didn't use, I guess, um, numbered switches. Um, I took the center, um, a center piece of um, a spline um, and created all these curves off the main line. So they were very natural tangents and transitions. And then I use the I use those that that center line to build my switches, so that even when I'm, a train runs through a switch, uh, switch siding or on a main line, it it appears to be smooth and not kinking kinking at the joints of the between the uh, the cars. Uh, starting at the at the, you know at, at that end um, of the layout, uh, this is just above the duck under actually. Um, stock pens, um, one of the industries of the DNRGW. Uh, the pen is all scratch built. I went to, uh, when I was in Charm, I measured all these gates and, and, this, and uh, the, the chutes and ramps, and then I did some drawings, some basic details, uh, but you don't really need a drawing for this, this type of thing because everything is, is you know, is very random. For example, the, a kit would have, you know, an eight by eight post every you know, every six to four or six feet uniformly, and it just looks too new. What actually happened is a lot of these get bumped off over time. And rather than dig a hole and put another post in, they would just uh, cut a log and, and put a log in there to hold the, uh, the fencing. Some details around the, uh, the pen um, to keep uh, you know, wildlife and, and cattle out of the yards. Um, you needed uh, some cattle guards. There are none on the market, so I scratch built these with uh, some security fencing on each side. Uh, right at the top is uh, one of my um, scratch built stock cars. Um, the interiors of them, I put a lot of, sort of chopped up hemp and, and plaster and dye and so on, uh, uh, watercolor stains and so on to make it look, you know, quite. Uh, um, yeah, well used. Some of the white in there, I, the dust over it we, we, is typically lime that uh, would kill any insects and so on. Um, train going through, leaving uh, leaving uh, leaving Charmer. Um, on the bottom right is a scratch built um, uh, coal shed, and uh, um, I've often been asked why they put all the bracing and the studs on the outside. Uh, well, if you're filling that up with coal, it wouldn't take long to knock a board out if it was the opposite way. And the other thing is it's much easier to shovel the coal up against a flat wall instead of trying to get it between studs. So it makes for a very interesting structure. Um, beside the, uh, just beside the, uh, the pens is uh, uh, the Hickorilla Cooperage Company. This was one of Mount Albert's first uh, kits that I converted to a uh, cooperage. Um, 
the kit uh, theme uh, didn't suit uh, you know my layout and time frame, um, but I liked the kit and uh, yeah, I did a lot of uh, some customizing to it. Um, I customized the sign and there's a large uh, larger version. I did this on Photoshop and then took a barrel and sliced the barrel uh, in half and put it on so there was a nice sort of a 3D sign. Um, chew mail pouch uh, this is on the back of the building. Uh, and I wanted to get that hand painted effect. So this was all printed on paper, paper sanded, uh, extremely smooth and thin on the back till, till the ink just barely showed. Uh, I glued it on the wall, uh, pressed all into the, 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 the grain and the cracks, and then ran a blade and, and split the, uh, the paper on those uh, plank joints. So it actually looked like it was on, the, on paint. Uh, the depot uh, is all scratch built with the exception of the shingles up here and the end shingles, courtesy of Banta. Um, otherwise, it's, it's all scratch built full size. Uh, the interior of the of the uh, waiting room is detailed, and there is a sound effect of a telegrapher in in the uh, the front. This is the uh, car shop. Um, this is uh, mostly scratch built. Uh, the walls are actually from York, uh, one of the early kits for it was supposed to be for a, um, a, a locomotive engine. Um, but I reconfigured the, the walls uh, to suit this uh, particular structure. The roof comes off. It's all into detail in, inside. Um, on the back of it, the other photo shows you the uh, this, uh, um, boiler house attached to the back, all fully detailed. There's a boiler in there, twin cylinder steam engine, there are machines inside the shop. And I should have that shot coming up, I think. Yeah. Um, an outside uh, view here of some activity. Uh, in this case, they're rebuilding a boxcar. And I have some more information about that shortly. An overall view is on the right uh, in front of the, uh, the shops, the stiff leg derrick that would uh, lift material off of incoming flat car and lay it on the ground or, or send something away. Um, Behind the roundhouse, there's the uh, oil and oil and fuel facility. It has glass windows and doors on the front. Um, this is one of York's very early, early um, uh, tool car uh, out of a uh, to look like a well, a box car looking like a tool car uh, in a in a much shorter version than the standard. Um, and beside it is a pipe rack. This is a pipe rack I scratch built um, and uh, I modeled it after one that was in uh, Silverton uh, and took some measurements and did some drawings and fabricated that the, earlier this year. Um, and one of there's a manufacturer, which I'll mention later on, who has asked permission to include that in his kit and that'll be coming up. Um, just a close up now of the, uh, uh, the work area uh, outside the shops has the box car being rebuilt. Taken off, which leaves a lot of holes in those locations. And the nut and bolt on the end of the truss rods have been re removed as well to be repainted. Um, and if you look, well, you can't see it, but if you, can if you feel it with your fingernail, I threaded the ends of the, the truss rods as a little added detail. There's the two doors uh, to go on, they're ready to go on. Stack of lumber, uh, some tarps to protect materials in, uh, in the evening. Um, interior of the shop, you can see uh, the boiler is back in here and the steam, uh, you can see the twin cylinder steam engine sits over here, which is just in behind. Uh, and it drives the main belt and all the line shafts run off of that. And um, there's a crane here that moves back and forth to move materials for the, uh, you know, the machinery. Uh, next is the roundhouse. Uh, this is a York Models kit. Um, and uh, I used the walls and then I had to refabricate four stalls, you know, with custom size to fit my locomotive so they could all go in there. And uh, in, there's some interior detailing and lighting inside. 
the roof is removable, which you can see from this little piece that uh, puckered up here, um, so that I can maintain the inside with uh, clinging rails or, or uh, getting rid of the odd cobweb. There's a picture on the bottom left shows the boiler house in the back of the roundhouse. Some scenes around the front of the roundhouse. Uh, the turntable is scratch built. Um, and the drive is a New York Railway Supply Company uh, drive and control panel. The interior, the, the roundhouse on the top right. Uh, some lighting inside. Um, and, I, and I've got a little, I used um, um, some two, I'm not sure what you call it, it's a tubular lamp. Um, above each door that would throw light back in because the LEDs uh, just uh, were not bright enough to uh, throw the right light uh, for, you know, for, for my purpose. Um, some hand cars out in front with uh, a visiting RGS inspection car. Um, bottom right, you can see lots of activity going on at the end of the day. One thing I didn't mention at the beginning, I should have, I guess, um, uh, my time period is October the 17th, 1937 at 4 p.m. And a lot of people ask why. Uh, well, I thought it was nice to have a, have a date because I wanted to work towards something. And uh, October the 17th, you're basically getting into fall. So the aspens are all turning gold. You get nice contrast against all the pines. Um, and so that was the reason for the, the, the date. And uh, uh, 4 p.m., well, it's the end of the day and uh, guys are getting home from, uh, from their various operations. Um, my time period being 1937 is, I, I like that time because I didn't like the, the flying arrow. And yeah, I can also model a post-depression, but what I don't do is I don't build a model that looks like they're completely falling apart because the whole town would look like that. And that's obviously not my, not my purpose. I like to keep things that are fairly well maintained as best as possible financially. Um, again, just more scenes on the roundhouse. The, the tool rack um, what is actually in Charma. It happens to be in a different railroad. And um, I saw a, an image of that and I thought uh, that looked uh, like an interesting structure with all the rods and so on to clean out the flues and the, uh, the ash box. Um, from the roundhouse, so just another view. And the, 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 this is another example. If you look at most of these pictures, you'll see that uh, the um, the um, backdrops uh, fill in almost all your scenes that you, when you photograph them. Uh, some just some other areas around uh, uh, around the uh, uh, the yard. So you've got the hobo at a campsite. There's a fire pit going over here. Uh, afternoon chats and figures, you know, just having a chat in the afternoon. Uh, scratch built um, stiff leg Derek. Uh, the section house on the side. Um, and a scratch built um, plow, uh, gondola plow. Um, these were, this was a one of a kind. That is, is, uh, in brass and the rest is all scratch built. Um, a little further down through uh, the yards is warehouse B. There were actually two warehouses, uh, Wool Warehouse A and Wool Warehouse B. I believe they were probably independently run and owned. They weren't owned by the railroad. Most of my most of my scratch built models, uh, buildings, I used foam core to, to get a sense of shape and size. I did the same thing for this building. Uh, I measured this building when I was down there. Um, and then I decided, well, it's all covered in corrugated anyway, so I'll just put the corrugation siding right on the foam core. And uh, so that's what, that's what I did, other than the, the roof structure, of course, where all the joists show. Uh, and you can see I pressed in for nail holes along the, you know, along the, the, um, the surface into the framing inside. So we're getting down to the east end of Charma now, and uh, this is uh, the fueling area. So you got the scratch built uh, coaling tower in the background. Uh, he's loading up. It has a sound effect of coal coming out of the chute. Um, the the uh, uh, sand house is also scratch built. 
Um, I scratch built the um, extending feeder tube. Uh, that was the original. Today, it's just a big rubber hose that hangs down. Uh, so I, I was able to create some drawings of how this worked so that they extended. The um, um, sand house, as I say, is all scratch built. All these uh, posts, I wanted to look fairly rugged. So after you know putting a few little cuts and scratches into it, um, then I used uh, wood putty uh, body filler uh, to put little nodules on randomly to look like um, you know um, limbs that have been hacked off and cleaned up. Uh, so you get this rough log. Uh, you can see the cinders and a lot of coal spillage around uh, the track. Very typical of Charmy Yards. Uh, uh, the area between the rails is almost com you don't even see ties. It's just uh, all ashes and cinders. Now this is a view looking uh, looking east towards the end of the layout. The Coning Towers here with the sand house. Um, the uh, the ash pit is off on the bottom on the right hand side. This is Terrace Avenue, and these are a variety of uh, kits that I've uh, built and modified. Um, they're not the ones in Charmer. Um, it be, wouldn't, be it wouldn't be a very busy street if I did Charmer because the buildings are smaller and spread out. Um, but it is the way it, it sits in Charmer right now, the Terrace Avenue and, and, the, and the, uh, uh, the shops and stores overlooking the yards. Um, that I had to put on as an extension uh, off the four by eight sheet that this part is on. Um, to get that backdrop just on that one section. And then bottom left is just looking backwards uh, to, along the back of the, uh, the reef stores and so on. This uh, four images of some of the, uh, the structures. Um, the, uh, the most, some of these, some have uh, interior detailing and lighting as you see on, on Susie Bordello and Pool Hall uh, and a couple of the others. Bull Durham is uh, a, a plastic kit by Trains of Texas that very rare. Uh, it's actually a building that uh, in uh, Blackhawk, I believe. Uh, and I had to hand paint that sign uh, because the decal that came with the kit fell apart, so old. And um, you can see some of the other stores along the bottom. A uh, couple of little back of the back of the house uh, details, the truck and a work, a little shop there in the corner, uh, which is over here. And then uh, by putting the buildings along the front edge of the, the layout, facing the, layout, the railroad, allowed me to uh, create an area of, uh, of, of the back street and on the details on the back of all of these places, which can also be extremely interesting. And um, so slowly adding detail as, as it goes along. Some of the structures I haven't aren't in place yet because I, I haven't uh, decided on, on the orientation yet. Um, these are some photos of the scratch built coaling tower uh, with the balanced buckets over here. Going up for fueling and you can see get another shot of what the uh, the, the support structure for the sand house looks like. Um, there's some uh, another shot in detail of the sand house bin. And then an overall going looking across from Terrace Avenue across the yard uh, to the cooling facilities. And those are the cottonwoods in the back that were all sponge technique with uh, uh, the sea sponge, which is much coarser. And then some additional views of the yard close up of the cooling tower with a huge piece of sheet steel here to protect the wood of this building from the cold fall uh, that get uh, knocked over onto the walls. Um, some details of the, the bin support and the, up at the top. And you can see the different coloration and the weathering that I put into all the timbers. And I pre-weather everything before I assemble it. Everything is pre-weathered, pre-painted, whatever it needs. Um, you can't do it afterwards and, and have clear separations, uh, you know, of, of weathering. 
Um, this is the ramp for the, uh, uh, the sand house. Um, there's a stone wall here, which I'll get into it a, a, little, a little later on. Uh, the stone wall is all scratch built stone by stone. Uh, very few of my, on the bottom, on the bottom one, very few of my tenders are loaded to the brim with coal. Um, unless, unless it's just left the calling tower, um, you know, coal does get depleted. Uh, in this case, this guy's shoveling the very last few and I hope that he can get to uh, get to uh, uh, town before they run out of steam. And then this is the wall that's starting to erode. And I said, oh, there's a detail there that uh, uh, I'll talk about later. Um, he has an overall view of the, uh, where this is the double spout uh, water tank. Um, shingles, I'll talk about it another time. These are all individually cut as are the ribs. Um, on the right is uh, the fuel, the oil dock. Uh, that's all scratch built. Uh, mode, because of being pipe, uh, that could be very flimsy. Uh, all these are in a, in a, in a, in a MDF base. I drill holes so that they got a good base. And then uh, the material is either piano wire, very, you know, uh, uh, stiff brass in some of this piping in here. Uh, there's some tubular brass. Uh, so it's, it's a very strong structure but, um, by the choice of those materials. And at the end of the yard is another fuel facility over here. It's all scratch built. Um, I was in Charma uh, three years ago and uh, they now have a platform on the side of all the junk. And so I thought that um, would be interesting to model, so uh, I did that uh, last spring. <laughs> the uh, red structure here is their fire equipment, and there was a time when they, they didn't stay shut, and they did actually have a rock out in front to hold the door shut. Uh, here, this is the front view of this section of this uh, storage house that you see on the left, because uh, on the far side of it is a little added structure for the hand cars to go in and it's all detailed inside with lanterns and ladders and all kinds of paraphernalia that they may have. And just leaving the yard, uh, my locomotives, uh, all, almost, almost all my cars are scratch built except the, uh, the ones from the uh, Grand Line, like the drop bottom guns and the tank cars. Um, when I say they're scratch built, many are scratch built, but if the if you had a, uh, uh, a kit uh, from Tamalco, uh, basically was scratch building. Um, the locomotives are all brass. They all have uh, uh, tsunami sounds in them and everything operates wirelessly uh, using NCE throttles. Um, there you get a fairly good shot of uh, the texture that the, uh, the, the uh, cinders give. And I'll go over that. Um, application uh, on part three. And thank you very much for your patience and your, and uh, your interest. Uh, we'll continue this in part two in a couple of months. So if there's any questions. Uh, thank you, Les. Um, and Dave, have you been monitoring the chat? We've had a lot of very uh, positive comments about uh, things as you've gone along, Lex. Uh, Dave? Yeah, I was going to say uh, there there aren't any there there is one one question, and that is where do you get your figures? Okay, my um, my early figures were all CHB, uh, which weren't highly detailed. I still use them. Um, most of my figures now uh, come from Aspen. Uh, I do have, a, I did have uh, a couple of um, plastic ones, which I use around the, um, the, the depot. I'm not sure, can't remember the name of, uh, they make these little plastic fig figures. They're fairly cheap. I just repaint, repaint them. And the highly detailed ones are 3D ones from, uh, uh, from Andean models in Australia. They're not cheap, 
but they are worth every penny. Um, so I'm using those, you know, in, uh, you know, in groups so that they add to the, mm -hmm. the detail effect and the realism. I like to, I like to try and do uh, storylines. Uh, so I don't just draw people just randomly uh, or even cars. I try to put a group together so that there's, there appears to be a reason for them to be uh, being together, whether they're talking to each other in groups or if it's an action, like uh, there's one where there's a figure just walking to throw a switch at a, at a water tank. So there's kind of an action. So the, you know, the, the figure and the, and the mechanism all linked together as a, as a story. So I, that's what I try to do. And so those are the figures that I've been using. Okay, well, thank you. There was another question in here as well, Lex, and that is, what are you using for sound playback for the thunderstorm? Um, well, years and years ago, <laughs> I had a, a real, a real, the real recording set, and um, we had uh, one heck of a thunderstorm. And so I put that I had uh, two channels. I'd put a speaker, a microphone, on each one, and then I'd go outside, and I would just record the left channel, and then after a little while, I go and record the right channel, so that it wasn't. It was completely separate. It wasn't like stereo that blends the same sound in two speakers. Um, and then I re recorded, I transferred that onto a cassette, which I run on, on a cassette player. And so the two sounds come out independently uh, on each speaker and ceiling. And I have to turn it down, but it gets, it, when, it, when I do run it, it certainly gets attention. Okay, great. And there's one last question in here amongst all of the accolades and everything that people posted for, for your wonderful presentation. And that, that question is, did you ballast the entire railroad with cinders or are there other types of ballast outside of the uh, cinders? Or okay. Outside of the, uh, yards? So I'll take that one from part three. Uh, <laughs> I honestly didn't find any ballast that was realistic enough. And when I was in Charma, uh, and you know, you look at you look at the, you know the landscaping and and and, uh, and structures and so on, and I noticed that it was relatively fine and it wasn't rock-sized ballast, and some of it isn't. You know, I'm sure that some of the sections do have it, but for the general um, appearance, you never saw heavy ballast. So I thought, well, I'm going to try something. So I I sat in in the ash pit in uh, Strasbourg. I prepared, I was prepared, I took a, a frame with a sieve and they, uh, stapled to it and a box and, and a shovel, um, a little pooper scooper shovel actually. Um, and I was sitting there and shoveling and sifting the sand, in, the, the cinders into it. So the heavy stuff, I, I didn't want it. Funny enough, I, did, I had a Japanese tourist couple walk in the yards, came up to the ash pit and, and in, broken, in broken English asked me if I was panning for gold. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that's where the cinders came from. So, so um, I always cover my entire layout uh, using clay sand. I don't let it has to be exposed. So to save the cost sometimes of things like ballast, I would put the first layer between the tires very thin just to build up. Then I'd sprinkle the, the, the cinders on. Now the cinders have a lot of dust in that in them as well. Uh, and they don't look like ballast. But once you water it down with white glue and water and you missed it and it goes, the, the, fine, the fine silt washes to the bottom, you know, putting in a good base, but then it leaves all the aggregate on the surface. And it's a really nice scale. And it's all kinds of color tones of grays and blacks. And uh, so it gives you that very nice pebble effect. But in the yard, I, I use real coal in the tenders and um, I, I, I have, you get soft coal and you can crush it, which is what I do. And, and I create very fine uh, coal dust as well. And the yards are all covered in, in coal dust uh, in appropriate areas as well. And I've used and I've used ash out of the ash pit, uh, the fireplace at home for, for some, some same coloring that you can brush in and get the sort of grayish white effect. Hope that helps. 
Yeah, well, thank you, Russ. I think uh, that takes care of the questions that folks posted in the in the chat window. Thank you. And, okay. Uh, well, thank you, Lex. Um, I know how hard you've worked to put this together. Yeah. And I've had the pleasure of seeing your layout now several times. And I uh, encourage everybody to stay tuned for the future presentations. Uh, this is way, way more than you'd ever get to see if we visited your layout at an yeah. open house. Because you'd be you know, shoulder to shoulder with a whole bunch of other guys trying to look at the detail. So we very much appreciate what you've done and looking forward to seeing you in October when we will present part two. Look forward to it. Thank you very much.